Hi guys, welcome to Winsome Cottage Garden. My name is Hannah and I'm so glad that you decided to join me today. Today we're going to be talking a little bit about plans I have for 2024. I did a tour not too long ago in my new house. If you're new to my channel, welcome. Thank you so much for joining. I'm excited you're here. Last fall I moved and my new home garden is a bit of a blank slate, which I'm really excited to, be to begin filling in. And one of the areas that I've spent a lot of time thinking about is the vegetable garden. If you're a returning viewer, you know that on this channel, we actually document two gardens, uh, the home garden, as well as our cottage garden, which is actually where my parents now live, but I'll always call it the cottage garden. Um, I have typically grown a lot of the vegetables, fresh vegetables that my parents utilized and siblings utilized for a variety of reasons. But when they've moved up to the cottage full time, one of the things that they wanted to do is add a vegetable garden. Last year was our first year in that space and we learned some lessons and we've come up with a plan to do things a little bit differently this year. So in this video, I thought I would walk you through two, both spaces and how we've planned it out for the year and some challenges uh, and possible solutions that we're looking into for them. First, let's start with the home garden. I mentioned I moved last fall and this garden is a blank slate. I am really excited to get stuck in, but one of the challenges that is really presented this year is knowing the yard. I don't think you really know the yard a ton until you've been there a couple of seasons. So the fact that I moved at the end of September when the sun was already a little bit lower in the sky, I have an idea of where the sunlight is, but I don't really know how the angle of the sun will affect the sunlight in the backyard. Since I did move at the end of September and it was lower in the sky, I'm not sure what it's gonna look like in May, June, July, the bulk of the growing season. In my backyard, I do have a hedge of hemlock separating me and the neighbor behind me, which I really love because it provides this beautiful green, evergreen wall between me and them and a lot of privacy. However, the path that the sun travels in my backyard is definitely over behind these trees. So because these are very mature trees that are nice and tall, the backyard doesn't get a ton of sun and there's really only two places that I think would be considered full sun, which is where you want to plant a vegetable garden. The first of which, which would honestly be better in terms of sunlight, I at this point want to reserve for a, a landscape garden of, of annuals and perennials and all those things. I have a ton that I brought with me and I'm really excited to get some of those in. Um, so for this year, I have put it in what I think is the second choice option. Um, and we're not going to do anything permanent because the other challenge I'm facing is that of budget. Having just moved, which was a little bit more expensive, and having a number of different projects in the house that I'm working on this year, building a raised bed garden is not really on the list this year. It is something that I want to do down the road, but for now, I am going to be doing a combination of in-ground gardening, and if you followed my old raised bed garden at my old house, I utilized some horse troughs on my driveway to expand my space. The previous city garden was in an urban setting, quite small. I really did nook and cranny gardening. And I have a little more space here, which can be a dangerous thing. And before I fully commit to a permanent placement, I want to make sure that I live in it a season to make sure it's the right spot, right fit, right size for it. There are some other challenges I'm working with. I do have a septic tank and field that I need to avoid because you can't really plant much except grass on top of those. You could do a little, a couple other things, but you don't want to plant food on top of them or things that you're choosing to eat or anything for that matter. Like you don't really want to plant things with roots that will damage the drain field. So that is in consideration as I'm kind of spacing things out. And I'm really going to take this year to Make sure I have the veg a couple vegetables, more than a couple if we're being honest, um, but explore if the space is that's the best use of the space for it. And then in the next two, three, four years, I'll eventually build up that raised bed garden that I really enjoy utilizing. So without further ado, let's dive into the actual picture. I have my computer here. I wanted to share with you one of the tools that I use to plan my garden spaces. Now, if you saw a video I did last year, you know that in my real job, I do a little bit of graphic design work. So I started this process um, in my old garden in a, a design software called Adobe InDesign. Um, it's something that, and I'll honestly, like you have to pay to have, and there is a bit of a learning curve. It's not hard. I really enjoy it. Work use it all the time. But I wanted when I moved here to create the garden plan 
in a software that anyone had access to. So I did it in Canva. Canva does have a page subscription, but it also has a free version, which is what I've done with this. Uh, and it allows you to do all kinds of things, including like graphics and stuff for social. But what I love about it is I use it as a design software that's a little bit more robust than like a Microsoft Word or even a publisher or PowerPoint, which I know sometimes people will use for something like this because it's got a little bit more flexibility. So they have this thing called whiteboard, which is where I am right now with this. And you can see at a glance exactly what we're gonna be doing. What I love about the whiteboard is it does have reference points too. So I treat each of those little dots as being one foot apart. So I don't have to build a grid, it's already there. And I know it's basically to scale. I say basically because this space I haven't actually gotten out and fully measured, but I do feel like I have about 21 feet to work with that has solid sunshine. And that's what you are seeing here before you. So with Canva, what I'd like to do is just use the different elements and shapes um, to plan out my spaces. These are really just circles, squares, and some are filled, some are not. Lines helping me know what I'm working with. So for this, the other thing you can do that I like is zoom in. This is actually going to be going on the far side of my yard along the fence near the shed. The shed is something that eventually will go. And I think that gets a decent amount of sun because it should, it's not in the sun yet, but I think it will be quite soon is the long and short of it. Um, I'm thinking it'll get probably eight to nine hours of sun, which is full sun. It's not a lot of sun. I'm hoping in the summer it gets in the light a little bit quicker. I'm just going to have to plan. See, I'm thinking about purchasing. I saw a couple things on Amazon where you can actually purchase meters that you like sit for a couple days and they'll tell you how many hours of sunlight you get. If anyone has ever used anything like that, I'd love to hear about your experience or if you have a specific recommendation. I think I'm going to figure out one that I want to purchase and probably start putting out in May when I know that the sun is a little bit higher than it is in the sky in February. Um, yeah, and just kind of go from there to see, calculate true sun time. Here's a third place I could put a vegetable garden, but that's in the front yard, and I don't love that for a multitude of reasons, especially because I have other plans that I'd like to do there. But for this year, in the ground gardening, I'm going to be utilizing um, a long strip along the fence where I will set up tomatoes in the ground. Now, all of the tomatoes I'm planting are indeterminate tomatoes, which means they don't really stop growing. Uh, and I have had tomatoes grow quite large, um, probably eight plus feet. They kind of eventually curl over themselves and then it gets a little hard. But for, I think the fence is an okay spot. Right now I'm planning on being about a foot to a foot and a half off the fence. I'm not going to be able to walk back there, but it's not going to be growing up against the fence, which I don't really want it to do because it's a brand new beautiful fence that my dad installed expertly last year. Uh, as you can see from this picture, you can see all the varieties of tomatoes I'm planning on growing towards the back. The other thing that you should know is this is actually slightly sloped. So this is higher and then this is lower. And so I wanted to make sure I was putting the tomatoes, which grow a lot taller, um, at the back. Because the majority of the sunlight, like this is north, east, south, west, and the majority of the sun they get will be in the afternoon and evening. So I wanted to put the taller things at the back so they didn't shadow anything else. I've got that going for me. You can see all the different varieties. I'll just quickly kind of go through them. I'm not going to go into great depth about these uh, because I'm going to be doing a seed starting video soon enough where I start my tomatoes and peppers and I'll talk about the different varieties and what I love about them each individually in there. There are, I think, two new ones that I'm doing in this garden this year. One is the big beef, which is a like, uh, supposed to be a good nice round slicer. I talked about it a little bit in my seed haul video and the other is a German Johnson. The rest of these are tried and true favorites. I told myself I was going to scale down this year and this is my scaled down which isn't really scaled down and I own that uh, but I when I was trying to figure out what type of tomato I could cut I really came up blank and I could fit everything in here so I decided to do it all. As you can see we're going to do the big beef a Blinken, Dr. Wishy's, German Johnson, uh, and then I have two Paul Robesons, but then I have a San Marzano, and then over here I have 
uh, Super Sweet 100, Sun Gold, Jasper, and Blue Cream. If I know me, I'm probably gonna stick another cherry tomato in here. I think it's called blueberries. All of these I'm going to be growing on cattle panels. I do have a couple of um, cages that I might try for some of them, but I find in general, I like how they grow better on cattle panels. I find them a little bit easier to maintain. So that's the plan with the tomatoes. Then you'll also see these are the four four by two cattle troughs that I used to use on the driveway at the city garden that I'll be bringing in here. I debated whether I wanted to use them this year because I don't know if this is going to be their final resting place. And those are extremely heavy when filled with soil. This year I'm going to kind of fill them a little bit scant. Uh, not enough that it will affect the plants, but enough that if I did move them, I wouldn't have to remove everything. And the idea is if I was going to move them, it would probably be, be because I am finally building the raised bed garden and then I would just use some of the soil in it to fill other beds. But these are going to be probably two to three feet off the ground, which is really convenient um, for things like peppers. So you don't have to bend over all the time when you're harvesting them. This, I like to plant three peppers to a trough. I have tried four before and it does affect the output of the peppers. This year I am majorly scale, scaling back on peppers. These are my bare bones. I am doing three new ones, but they're because they're peppers I intended to purchase last year and bought the wrong kind. And that would be these lunchbox peppers. I have, a, I have an orange, a red, and a yellow. And then I also have two corbachis, which are the really long skinny ones that are red and they're sweet and tasty. Two shishitos, which I do like to pop in my air fryer and eat of an evening as like a side. It's really quick and easy and great with just some salt and pepper. Sometimes I'll make an aioli to like eat with it as well as two green peppers. What you do not see on this list, which is was a very difficult choice to make, if I'm being honest, is I do not have yellow horn peppers, which I really love, or my Duda Spania, which are giant mammoth red peppers. And that's just taking a hiatus this year and will probably be back in the future. Uh, I also have a trough of green beans, and these are two grow bags that I am thinking will probably be greens, whether one will probably be arugula, one will probably just be different lettuces. Um, this area is getting a little close. You can't really see where this is in my yard, but right here is where the tanks are for my septic field. And since it is getting a little close, I'm just gonna plant them up and raised grow bags. Um, You'll also see that the squash trellis that I used on my driveway last year is making a comeback and I'm just going to be planting things directly in the soil. I will be doing, as you can see, two small pumpkins, which I'm excited about, a zucchini, a melon, a butternut squash, and a spaghetti squash. I think I could fit more, in all honesty, because I do believe I had five on each side last year and they didn't perform super well. I do have a tendency, however, of doing too much. So I already think I'll probably plant, I might up it to four per each side, but if I do plant four, it would probably be adding a, um, some, another melon and an acorn squash or a different kind of zucchini. Haven't fully decided if I'm going to do that at all. So that's the plan for this. There's also going to be two long skinny beds where I do things in the ground, where I have another spot for greens, a small pet spot for rainbow carrots, snow peas, sugar snap peas, which I do need to buy trellises because I left them, and then a place for onions, which I haven't grown in quite some time, um, but I'm excited about. What you don't see in here that I've typically planted are cucamelons. I had a hard time last year keeping up and they took over. And I think I just need a break from cucamelons this year. I do really love them. I love eating them fresh. I might regret that, but that's, that's the plan I got in place for this year. I also have reserved this space entirely for vegetables. If you know me, you know that a lot of times I will also plant dahlias and dracaenas and, 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 and so many different other things in these beds with them. 
This year I am starting a lot of perennial flowers and a handful of cut flowers, but not the same scale as I typically do, at least for this garden or in general, I think. I haven't started my seeds yet and I don't know about you, but there is something that goes a little crazy when you're actually going to put seeds in the cells. And even if you've calculated how many cells you want to start, I'm always like, well, well what, if, what if six of them die? Maybe I should do double the amount I actually need. And then, but the problem is when there's actually plants, you're like, well, but now I have them. I should go plant them. At least that's a conundrum I always run into. So um, I have decided that I will be doing a handful of cut flowers and stuff, but I'm going to be planting those in the area where I want the landscaping bed to be. I do have a handful of plants that I brought with me, uh, and I will get some of those in the ground. This year, however, um, I'm going to buy as many of the structural plants that I can as my budget allows. Um, and I don't think I want to get too far into a garden bed with smaller items until I have those structured plants figured out, especially since the sunlight in the backyard is a little bit questionable. So that's well, the plan for the vegetable garden at the new home garden. I'm really excited to get in this space. The soil looks pretty good. It's a little bit sandy because we are pretty close to Lake Michigan. We're about mm, three miles away. If you're not familiar with Lake Michigan, it's one of the Great Lakes in, I think the Great Lakes are the largest body of fresh water in the world. Uh, it's got where I am on the west coast of the state of Michigan along the east coast of Lake Michigan is a very sandy soil. It'll be well draining. I am, it looks nice. Like when I was working in it and planted a couple of things last year, I thought that it w was going to go well. So I am excited to see how it responds to vegetables. The, some ground that is also sandy is the cottage garden. Now, last year in the cottage garden, we built this vegetable garden from scratch. What they're using the space for right now is they have four, four by eight foot beds that are just a two by 12. Uh, so it's slightly raised, I should say. Their goal is to actually have something a, lot, a little bit higher. They're, they're not old by any means, but they like to say they're aging. And they want to make sure that the vegetable gardens they have in place are ones that they can comfortably access. So that last year was supposed to be the first year in the space, understanding the little space more and how they want to use it. And then this year we were going to design a more in-depth vegetable garden. One of the things we learned last year, we learned a number of different lessons. One, the garden is slightly sloped. And even though we did kind of even the beds up, the water definitely pooled on one side. The other thing is the dirt we used held moisture really well, a, a little too well in some cases, especially because we had planted um, tomatoes and peppers in the same spot like in the same bed and it became very difficult to water them because the peppers were getting way too much water and the tomatoes weren't getting enough water. Um, the peppers were a little bit stunted because I think it didn't get super warm last year there um, and peppers really like heat. So what we've decided to do to combat the, the, that this year is we're putting tomatoes in the same place we did last year, um, but instead of planting peppers here, which is what they are, we're going to be doing some root crops, which I don't think will rot. I think part of the problem was there weren't enough pe peppers to like soak it up. So we're hoping that by doing a, a good number of parsnips and carrots and whatnot, because the carrots here did really well. Uh, and we also had beans over here that did well, that these will be okay. We'll also adjust the water accordingly. You'll see that my parents have focused in on tomatoes that they are excited about. The, the big beef are nice round slicer ones. We haven't tried it, but like the reviews were really great, which is what my parents were looking for. Paul Robeson is a favorite though. It is a bit of a, it needs a lot of nutrients. Paul Robeson is not one I would recommend planting in, in a pot or a grow bag because they just don't do well. They've got an amazing flavor. It is my favorite tomato, but part of that amazing flavor comes from the nutrients it needs. The other thing about Paul Robeson's is they never fully, like their shoulders of the tomatoes never really ripen. And so my parents were a little frustrated last year because they didn't get quite the output that they wanted. Now, one of the problems my parents did face last year was birds. So at the cottage, and I'll pop a picture on the screen from last year, there's water, the lake is right here. 
and it's not Lake Michigan. It's a different lake, but the lake is right here and there's probably about a five to seven foot stretch between the seawall and the vegetable garden. And right about here is a purple martin house. One thing we did not consider was that the purple, like, cause we've never had a problem. We've grown tomatoes and stuff and pots up on the deck of the cottage for a really long time. We've never had a problem. We've had a problem with chipmunks. We've never had a problem with birds. Last year, the chipmunks didn't bother it, which we didn't think they would because since it's so close to the water and it's in a very exposed place, there's more predator pressure there. We have eagles, we have hawks, we have all these other things that can get them. There's also snakes that live in the rickrack along the seawall. Um, and the good news is the chipmunks didn't eat our tomatoes. The bad news is that the purple martins pecked them. So what we've learned is we need to do netting. Um, and my parents did some mid-season, um, just like what they could get their hands on from a big box store. And it helped them get a second wave of tomatoes, but we're looking into better solutions this year that we can make this a little bit more accessible. Um, and one of the problems we had was trying to keep the tomatoes from growing into the netting. So we want them off the netting a little bit. We're trying to figure out the best way to do that. If you've had a problem with birds eating tomatoes and fruits, please share it with the group what you did other than netting or if you have a favorite type of netting or make recommendations on things to consider when netting your garden i'd love to hear more so what we're doing though to get back to this is last year we actually planted in this area um, cabbage which we won't be doing this year instead we're going to do onions right along the outside in the ground and then have grow bags for some potatoes which i've done before with a lot of success and the only two peppers my mom and dad really wanted this year were green peppers. I suspect when they see I'm not growing yellow horn peppers, they might decide to grow those too. We thought grow bags would be a better solution to this because they all dry out a lot faster. We can also move them into an area where they're going to get more sun because peppers like to bake. Um, the other thing we're doing is on this uh, arch last year, we did, I don't think the things that we planted did very well. We did some peas, which I do think came, a bird ate some of the seeds. We shifted what we were doing halfway through the year and didn't have a problem. I think the squash just didn't produce anything. So one of the things I'm doing is I'm going to be starting stuff early. I don't, in general, squashes like it better if you can plant them in place. I don't think with our growing season that works in this. So we're going to be doing our zucchinis and squash early. We'll have a new type of zucchini, a crookneck yellow squash, a butternut squash, and a spaghetti squash. Again, not trying to overcrowd this. I might, this one is a little bit shorter than my tunnel because it's a um, cattle panel, so it's only about 48 inches. So I think the two and two make sense here. We'll also be doing some pole beans, some snow peas, and some sugar snap peas and teepees along the outside. And because there's still a lot about usable ground space, we'll also be throwing some Brussels sprouts in there. And I suspect we'll put some alyssum and other really pretty things in to help weed suppression, attract pollinators. So that is the plan. Oh, and fill in the space with green beans. I started to say that um, so that we have a ton of green beans. My parents also have green stalks, which they utilize up on the deck. We've had strawberries in them the last few years. This year, we did not bother bringing them into the garage. The strawberries um, just really didn't produce well. And I think we're going to be, the plants are getting a little bit older. They should be replaced anyway. And instead of, we'll keep any strawberries that survive the winter because it's been fairly mild. So I suspect some will survive. And we will be planting green beans in there as well as lettuces, kale, all herbs, all that kind of stuff get planted right on the deck. So you don't have to walk all the way down to the vegetable garden anytime. You need just like a handful of chives or something. That is what we have planned in the vegetable gardens in the two spaces. I am really excited to see how it all comes together. I'm excited to be growing in this new space. My parents are honing in on the things that they really enjoy cooking with and utilizing, things they want to preserve, as well as things that they didn't really want to do. Like you'll notice in these tomato types, which I don't think I ran through, they have a Chadwick cherry, and a super sweet 100 and those are the only two cherry tomatoes they're growing 
I love a rainbow in my cherry tomatoes. My parents, they really just like the plain red ones, especially if they're flavorful. So they've got those two. They're also focused on this year growing tomatoes that they can preserve but are prolific. So we're trying out a number of new hybrids. I mentioned the German Johnson and the Big Beef previously, the Paul Robeson's a tried and true favorite. And San Marzano's are very prolific plum-like tomatoes that are great for preserving. We've also got a Gran Granadero, Gran Grandero. I'm not quite sure how to pronounce it. And then we're gonna try those and see how it goes. I asked my parents what their must grows were. Uh, and then I figured out a plan and talked to them about how we could fit it all in. My dad in particular really wants to, once everything is planted to like print this out and laminate it so he knows what's where. Um, even though they're all labeled, he likes a map. And that's what's really nice about this too, is I can share it um, and then you can choose how you're downloading it. It can do a picture, I can do a PDF. Um, if it was a video, I could do that. Like, it's really great for all of these different things. And I think I told you that these are just a series of squares. Like one thing that's nice is uh, you can see I've locked this. So I've made the outside outline and then I locked it so I can't accidentally move it when I'm working with other things. I did squares for which I didn't, which are locked. What's locked is the square and the, um, this black thing represents a cattle panel. Um, so that is locked, but all of these things I can move around. What I do is I'll make one and then I'll just copy and then paste and move it where I want something else and change what it says. I like different color greens. They don't really designate a lot. It just helps me distinguish different items from each other. Um, and it's a great way to kind of build the shapes up. This is the trellis I made, I think with two curved lines or semicircles that I combined with two straight lines to make the trellis. Uh, and you can do a lot with just shapes. Canva is, I don't have an affiliate link. It's, this is a completely free program. You can pay for some softwares to help plan your garden if you're new. Um, sometimes that's easier if you're not sure on spacing. Read the seed packets. If they're a good seed packet, they'll have the spacing you want. And knowing you, the more you plant, the more you'll get comfortable with spacing and whatnot. I really feel like Canva is a great tool to use when these things and plants are really forgiving. Sometimes you can show them a little too much water. Sometimes they don't produce the right. Sometimes you have pests. There's so many things you can't control. But at the end of the day, seeds want to live, plants want to grow, and you learn a lot through some of the struggle about what plants like, what they don't like, and you can take that into the future for more information and adapt year after year what you're planning to do. I hope that this was interesting to you. I'm so excited to get our seeds started. If you saw my last video, we did some winter sowing method for a lot of flower perennials, actually all flowers. Um, and this next week, I am gonna be starting seed starting. And I'm excited. I need to figure out exactly where all of my grow lights are going because I don't really know the setup in this new house yet, but it's gonna be a great year. And I am looking forward to all the different things that we get to grow together. It's really amazing to look back and see from a planning video and the seed starting video to the jungle that a garden can become. It brings a lot of joy and I hope that you will be growing alongside with me. I really appreciate you joining me today. If you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button, subscribe, and I can't wait to see you next time. Bye-bye.